Yes, that's right. Are you able to do that for us? See it as a favour. We'll be forever in your debt. You can rely on us to carry out your bidding. A claw reached towards the control panel, bustling with lights, graphs, and the sound of an alien artifact sunken into a pool of liquid neon beneath summer palms. Night night from La La Land. It flicked a switch and the birds watched the men on the railings flicker like stars. Their skinny, naked frames glistening in a morning of daytime televisual reruns. The radios and TVs changed their output. In an instant, the programming went from soothing experience, conducted from the tranquility of a writer's garden shed, free from sex and violence and general dastardly behaviours to that of scaremongering and warnings and communiques that meant you, the citizen, better not step out of line. We'll have you tied to the side of the road and belting heat and whipped if you step out of line. And once we're done with that, we'll strap you to the front of a truck and drive you over a cliff. Got it? Don't think about turning us off or tuning out, throwing the paper in the bin. Watch these words lasso your fingers and drag them into the pit of your very imagination. Bathe in paranoia, amigo. Bathe. Feel the ink climb through your hands and up your arms, veins bulging with knowledge and worlds you can only begin to comprehend. I can taste you in my mouth now, all of it through the phone line. This is the old house where the old ladies live, here their teeth chattering porch floorboards as they wait for the young man with nothing much to do apart from fix their fridge and mend their fence. Watch him and wait. He'll come kissing soon. A man like him needs a warm bed. You'll hear the parrot farmers swinging in the bells. And so it was done. He couldn't believe that's all it took to get something like this to happen. He felt like a proper businessman. He felt tall. He'd been cynical in the beginning. An advert appeared in the local newspaper offering to grant respondents a wish. It was all rather cartoonish, but it sure beat making hoax calls to the town residents. That was becoming monotonous. This was exciting and experimental. He believed the majority of people who called might ask for something to help them progress through life, perhaps grant them enough freedom to never work again. That was the aim of the game after all, wasn't it? To never actually work again, to indulge yourself in pursuits that purely sate the body and mind without ever having to worry about paying a mortgage or finding cash to feed and clothe yourself and your family. At the other end of the line had been a creature in a dark basement deep beneath a far-off city. It sat at a large desk with a banker's lamp 
and a red phone. Water dripped down the walls, so it looked as if the room had been overrun by a swamp. Dank and sticky, and the streaks shimmered in the light. The switch. The silence. They stood, looking up at the trees in spring, taking the soft peaches and cerise colours of the blossoms into their eyes, their noses, their hearts. Light fading like old age before the inevitable. Serenity's gossamer veil draped daintily over the town square as the birds chirped and the cats lay languid under motor vehicles and the butcher lay down his knives for the day. There was peace out here in the bubble. It was a place without crime and without people it seemed, occupied solely by the two of them, husband and wife, holding hands on the path that led round the bowling green, still under the trees, the large burnt orange town hall with its gargoyles frozen in flight, teeth bared against an orchid sky and hushed by centuries of whispers that crept from the letter boxes and cat flaps of the surrounding homes and bothered their ears like naughty school children. This was the silent port, and their boat had come to rest for the night. The gentle lapping of the waves rocking them to sleep as mermen and women drank heartily in the harbour's bars, each clink of a glass, sending another mortal sailor on an odyssey beneath the table to flounder with the termites and the spittle, the ale and the blood. Not long before another sunk through the wooden waves to join them. Okay, that's enough. Back inside. They heard the words and saw the stick, a long, thin protrusion a black plongeur prick the membrane and with it the birds turn to dust and the flowers to flame. The butcher screamed white as he took his own hand off and slapped it against the shop window with a smile dark as rain and how the town cat clawed through the door to get at his stump. The couple came to in the bed. You let us sleep for once. They had slept due to utter exhaustion. Their bodies couldn't take it much longer. Their minds had been gouged out and put through a car crush. Hoovering up spiders. That's what I was doing in my dream. Hoovering up spiders and no matter how much I tried to get this one little black bugger, it just kept climbing back out from under the rollers and scuttling across the floor. I let him live in the end. And at this point in time, the last thing the man wanted to do was be alive. That all seems rather reasonable, she replied. The side of her face stuck to the worn pillow with saliva. Hers was a different type of sleep. One populated with thin white harpies, part sea eel, part woman. The lot of them draped over rocks that sprung from the ocean like diamonds. And they were cracking the shells of another animal over these anvils and sucking the flesh into their translucent throats. The food's journey traceable through the body from hole to hole. 
When was the last time she'd been to a restaurant to dine with friends? Where were her friends? How were they coping with all of this? Would they come knocking when it was all over? And what would they find? Two rakes of people, remnants of a loving couple, a bit here, a bit there, scattered through the home. Here, look at what's been left in the fridge. Ugh, gross. Or attached to the breathing apparatus and the other life-giving accoutrements they had been hooked up to. All of these scenarios would have been welcome. Their last drop of existence swirling round a plant pot in a garden with a prime view of the bay. But now there was something cold, swishing past their ear, scything into the ground. A giant steel gate to another realm, opening and closing and giving them a glimpse of the future. There was earth in their mouths, and the bugs had started to make use of their bodies as a new metropolis in which to breed and raise families with a million tiny legs and no need for televisions and microwaves. You like jugs, kids? Keep eating the cornflakes and we'll keep putting jugs on the telly. This internment comes to you courtesy of the nation's number one breakfast cereal. Swoosh, swoosh. The metal drove into the mud by their heads. Then a boot appeared and sunk it further into the sod. Are we to be trampled to death? I never in my wildest dreams thought this is how I'd die. The couple lay supine at the foot of the garden amongst the dying trees and the weeds. The little statue that had been consumed by the undergrowth, a gnome with a jaunty red hat and fishing pole. He appeared rather content to have been hidden away all these years, not a catch in sight. Pipe ties binding their hands and ankles, socks forced into his mouth, a pair of knickers into hers. These were a pair she'd bought for Valentine's a few years back, and she hadn't worn them since. I spent a pretty penny on these, she thought, tasting the silk. Do you like them here, honey? They didn't have to dress up for the occasion, but it seemed only right. He put on a suit and tie, she a dress. They were both a little big, but that didn't matter. It was the effort that counted. And he shone both their pairs of shoes, while she sat making them some masks to accompany their attire. And there was no reason to make masks, but something inside her said it would add to the effect. It would be more impactful, and today was all about impact. For weeks beforehand, they'd been plotting how best to coerce their chosen targets into remaining at home. But all it took was a quick phone call and besides, the news had told them so, and they'd better adhere to what was being broadcast or face serious repercussions. This was no time to be questioning authority. Stay out of my garden. Stop playing video games. Eat this. Do the dishes. Their home had shifted from being a claustrophobic environment suffused with passive aggression and the odd crockery projectile to an environment of out and out hostility. 
the suburban two up two down pressure cooker primed to explode on a whim in a frenzy of spit, feet and fists. It didn't help that they'd found an heirloom in the form of a knuckle duster whilst rummaging through the sacred desk. There were no more cam C's, all the emergency flares exhausted, apart from the two downstairs that were ready to ignite. At first, they had tried to barricade themselves in the bathroom, and this was proving successful, save for the lack of food. But their wild boar aggressors soon charged the door with their tusks, splintering the wood scraping their doughy, frightened flesh out from between the sink and the toilet where they'd squeezed themselves. We don't want to hurt you, but just show you how angry we are. But once they started hurting them, they found out they enjoyed it and would spend hours each day concocting new ways in which to torture their captives. From then on, they were to be held hostage in their own home, abused and raped daily because that's what you do in these scenarios. Molestation happened just days after a significant birthday. Stay out my garden. Stop playing video games. Eat this. Do the dishes. 41 scars over the head. And we're not talking about little ones, big as mice. They cycled under artificial skies and through hills and fire with gorse, butterflies acting as road signage before flitting off to visit flowering friends. A buzzard swooped low over their heads and people, slow in their movements, tended to their country gardens with shears past the farms of their ancestors, proud buildings perched like hawks above rolling pastures rich with grass in which they spun into gold. Sentient cattle lowed in the fields and the pylons hummed secrets to one another. As they pedaled, their legs tired and went to sleep and the rest of their bodies followed shortly after wild flowers everywhere. Why are you doing this to us? What have we done wrong? It doesn't have to be this way. We can change. We will change. We promise. Boring. Maybe we just don't like the look of your faces. Ever thought of that? Yes. We don't like the look your faces. Here, pass me that knife. Where's the reason? Fuck reason. At least tell us why the masks. They allow us to carry out these chores more effectively. Now watch carefully. The knife traversed the channel of the woman's face. The blade whittling across her cheekbone until it found the soft of her socket. With a sharp jab, it docked firmly beneath her left eye. She screamed the room blue. The invaders leered like clowns into the darkening hole as the ball hung past her mouth by the optic nerve. This perverse birthday party, complete with a balloon, filled with evil playing out in miniature. Her husband's face flooded with tears. You bastards, he yelled. You fucking depraved bastards. A welding glove struck him a blow to the side of his head then delved past his gnashing teeth and tore at his tongue, pulling it into the daylight as if it were a vampire being roused from its crypt of earth and worm. The blade, a goldfinch in flight, switched direction and with a swift strike sliced through this muscular rope bridge. Blood fountained into the masks, turning them dark with shadows, and Nosferatu tumbled from its cave to the floor, where it languished like a sick oarfish, washed up 
a deserted Californian shore. With the woman slumped to the ground, her eye drying against the carpet, the girl punched her between the legs and pressed the blade to her vulva. Screams ransacked the home and the birds lifted from the trees in the garden. And how the birds danced to the exotic sounds of the river and the mountains, the forest and the butterflies, the wind sensual, caressing the reeds and the dapple light of canopies. Now where's the dog? The boy imagined a canine locked round his forearm, shaking it like a snake. He beat it with a pull cue. The gang who owned the animal huddled round it with chains and whips, moving in and out in circles like characters from an arcade game. He struck at his head and body, and electronic sounds escaped him. A large, tall man with a handlebar moustache and a bare chest swung at his gut with an ale-infused club. A woman in a tight top knifed him in the kidney, then retreated as another harpy swept in and stabbed him in the back. He was bleeding on the street. He felt a splash of liquid in his face and he tasted it in his mouth. The fumes filled his nose. It was gasoline. He'd been doused and a match was lit and he went up like a candle. Now let's get you hard. The girl reached over and started stroking the man's penis. She looked upset. The man was in tears. Not having much success today, are we? She stared at his limp appendage. Stop it, please. Stop it. Maybe this'll help. She went to a chest of drawers and pulled out a selection of pornography. She leafed through the aged magazines. Looks like you were a fan of this one. She opened one of the booklets near the back, the section where readers sent in pictures of their wives. She's right. Look at her tits. It won't be long before she's crowning. Just what you want. The man continued to plead. A pathetic insect, wings broken, carapace ground into the carpet. I bet you didn't lose into this stuff, the girl asked the woman. I'm sorry, the man mumbled. I knew. The woman managed to garble and almost smirked. Her eye was a despondent space station orbiting a hostile planet. While this was going on, the boy had found the woman's hair straighteners. How's it going over there? The girl inquired. Good, the boy responded. The light clicked to show they were het up. Go over here quick then. He's rock fucking hard. The man was ashamed he was erect in these horrific circumstances. One last hurrah, old boy. One last hurrah. He was barely able to pee with strangers in bar toilets and service stations. And here he was performing while his wife of a quarter of a century lay face down on a rug with her eye gouged out. He felt sick and vomited. It was no longer him. His soul had left through the window and was drifting like mist across suburbia. His eyes clouded in pain unimaginable as the boy placed his penis in the straighteners, the scent of seal and flesh knocking him out. And with Cetus no more, the shorter human shadows became one and enveloped the woman. Sometimes you can feel your fingers dripping with dirt when you type. The mind, a pool of mud. When they awoke, they felt different. That night, the pylons had ceased buzzing, despite the torrential rain, and this morning, the hillside beyond their batch of tract housing was alive with flowers that climbed the legs of the structures, winding themselves around the metal, 
making a pilgrimage towards a being unknown, sat upon a cloud high up near the sun. Stigma singing, petals reverberating, the hill and all on it was resplendent with a different kind of life, and so were they, although their eyes had darkened and the hands at the end of their arms didn't feel like they belonged to them anymore, and their brains pulsated in their skulls like rogue animals. It's over now. The children stood at their parents' graves. The soil had been packed tight, and the little girl knelt down and planted some seeds. They deserved a half-decent burial after all they'd been put through. She wondered how big the sunflowers would get and if they'd block out the light to the house. It was a dark carcass in the need of an airing. For a split second she regretted the horror. On the outskirts of the town the mass loomed large and grey and still capable of taking control of the population at a moment's notice. But their work was done. They had proved a beacon in these testing times. A guiding power. One day we will celebrate you again. She looked over the garden fence and saw a thrush take to a small tree and sing. We better give them regular offerings, the little boy said. They might get upset if we don't. Christ knows what will happen then. He reached for his little sister's hand and led her back inside the house. It was to be theirs for the rest of their time on the planet, and she'd be able to garden, and he'd be able to play video games for as long as he liked, and the dishes could wait. Her child was on its way too.